Hey, what's up everybody? It's Lids, and we're back for some more Gwent, and today we are playing a new deck using a bunch of cards from the new Black Sun expansion, including Double Scenarios. Let's go take a look at the deck. So today we'll be playing a Nilfgaard Tactical Decision deck that is notable because it combines both Masquerade Ball, the old scenario, based on Aristocrats that gives us poison and control, and the new scenario, the Eternal Eclipse that uses Cultus, of the gold variety to just get a whole bunch of points and this is one of the few scenario pairings that are actually not that difficult to combine in the same deck which is of course pretty darn awesome so generally speaking our strategy here is going to be to play eternal eclipse in round one and all the cultists that go along with it to support it and not only does this give us points in round one, it can potentially give us some carryover value as well, which is why it makes a lot of sense to play this early. And then, of course, that means that we're ideally saving Masquerade Ball for round two, if we're looking to push in round two, or round three, which is a nice win condition as well. So how do we make that work? We make that work because we have, let's start with the cultist side of things, the maximum number of starting gold cultists in our deck, which is two, the profit, and... Also, the Master of Ceremonies, however, that's a little bit deceptive because by having this card in our deck, we will get two more gold units that are not usually cultists turned into cultists. So that means we, to start off with, have at least four cards that can trigger the scenario for the Eternal Eclipse in round one. However, we can further set that up, if necessary, using the Eternal Eclipse Deacon, because if we have a gold unit that is not a cultist in our hand, we can, on deploy, turn it into one, or by the time it's on the board, we can use that order ability and turn a unit in our deck into a cultist as well. And once we get the cultist scenario, the Eternal Eclipse kicking off, we will start to make it so that playing cultist just gives us a bunch of points on all of our cultists. So that's why that can be, yes, absolutely beneficial in round one when we play this scenario, but also even going into round two or round three. So that's really nice that it gives us value long term as well. Then, of course, for Masquerade Ball, well, that's more well understood, because been there, done that, right? Well, we have Vincent Van Morlehem, which is actually really nice, because not only is he a great control option for uh, any Nilfgaard deck, but because, just to talk a little bit more about the Cultists, we have the Eternal Eclipse Initiate that uh, will infuse an opposing bronze unit with this status that makes it so that when we destroy that card, we create a copy of it on our side and give the Cultist tag, which means because we get boosted whenever we play Cultist, it's, uh, it's going to actually be an engine. So since this gives that unit a status, we can even go after some fairly tall units. I mean, it does still need to be bronze, so we can't go crazy tall, but target something important and then use Vincent so that even if it feels like, oh, okay, we might not have otherwise had enough damage or removal options to get rid of it, Vincent is just a guaranteed, it is now gone. So really nice option to have there. And that's how there's actually surprisingly... A fair number of synergies between the uh, Masquerade Ball archetype for just pure control and the Cultist archetype, which benefits from that control to help destroy your opponent's units that have those infused statuses so that you can create copies of them on your side of the board. And then similarly, we can potentially remove Fruit Poison with Philippe. So that's another way to make it happen. And he's an Aristocrat, so he works for Masquerade Ball as well. And similarly, once again, Aristocrats that happen to work really well for the Cultists, Shelard. Lowering down the tallest unit in our opponent's hand to a 1 means that we can potentially mark that unit with the infusion, and that's a really easy target for us to destroy in that case. And in general, Shelard just is a nifty card to have as well. So that's really the gist of it. Other than that, in terms of how we make sure that we actually draw into and play those cards, that's where our leader ability tends to come in. So with our leader ability, we can draw three cards, of course, with Tactical Decision. And the way we make sure that that gives us a scenario is, of course, we can draw into one. That's obvious. We can use Onero, which, okay, that's obviously also a way that we could get the scenarios. But we have a few ways when combined with our leader ability that give us additional options. Because Jan, when we play him, will put all of our cards in our deck in order of highest provisions at, at the top and lowest provision at the bottom. And so that means we're if we don't have a scenario in hand, guaranteed with Yon to put it at the top of our deck. So then we, after playing Yon, use our leader ability, draw into all of our tallest cards, and that way we can make sure that we get a scenario. Similarly, with Fisher King, 
it's not quite as effective because in this case we're just choosing one specific card and he actually probably would prefer to get a Nero in this case if you don't have it so that way you can use that to tutor in one scenario in round one the eternal eclipse and then use the echoed copy of a Nero to get masquerade ball in round two or round three if you happen to draw into it just use it to get whatever you need so one thing to consider though that's how you make it all work and just with the scenarios of course you get tons of boosts from the eternal eclipse and tons of removal from masquerade ball but uh, one thing to consider is that we are because we're trying to play both aristocrats and cultists a little bit concerned about blowing through all of our uh aristocrats in round one and not having enough to trigger masquerade ball remaining in round two or round three so just keep an eye out for that and vice versa for the cultists so shouldn't be too much of an issue if you just keep that in mind but uh, it is potentially something that could cause you a little bit of trouble. But of course, we can create additional cultists in our deck using the Eternal Eclipse Deacon. So that's one way to make sure that it's not going to completely break your deck. And I mean, we still have uh, in our starting deck, certainly enough aristocrats and uh, a decent number of cultists, at least once we start creating additional copies of them. Just uh, consider that so you don't find yourself getting a nasty surprise at the end of the match. But with that being said... Let's go see this double scenario deck in action. All right, so going up against Northern Realms here, and we'll go first. Okay, so we have the Eternal Eclipse in hand. We also have one, make it two, gold cultists, so we can trigger both chapters of it. We have at least a little bit of additional setup with additional cultists. We'd probably like to swap out and get a little bit more with things like Profit. And then Fisher King we could use to get Masquerade Ball at the top of our deck, or we could just rely on Onero to make that happen for the next round. And given how we have one of the scenarios and we have Onero to get the other, then maybe we just go for something other than Fisher King. And maybe we'll just get Masquerade Ball directly. Okay, um, we actually, I mean, we can make this work, although, okay, it's more cards that help set up Masquerade Ball. We're in a, actually a little bit of a tough spot here. Because we have so many cards. We have a lot of good cards. Many of which we actually would like to uh, probably save. Like Masquerade Ball for a subsequent round. Or save to use to trigger Masquerade Ball. Like Thirsty Dame. Like Philippe. And like the other Thirsty Dame. So I think we will still probably start though. With the Eclipse Deacon. And with you. We're given cultists to one of you guys. I think it's Thirsty Dame. So again, those are primarily cards that we would like to keep as go-tos for uh, for uh, Masquerade Ball. Okay, so Danian Knight now, of course... They're using the newly reworked Royal Inspiration, which probably means we're going to see a whole lot of knights here for the the new, possibly even the scenario, Damsel in Distress for Northern Realms. So let's see. We might look to use our stratagem early here. The other card that started off with the Cultist Tag was Vincent. Because I'm thinking we might want to get rid of this Thirsty Dame and try to save that for a later occasion and maybe get some additional Cultist support of some variety, like with just an initiate, even. So, I think we will do that, in fact. I think we will do that, so that we have a more natural round one. We'll put the one back that does not have the cultist tag, and then make someone else into a cultist. I like hunting pack. We'll, uh, I think we'll go scenario. I think we will go scenario. Now that we have a few more cultists ready to go here, we have a little more support for it. We have, what, one, two, three, and potentially four. Okay, so they're going to try to activate this grace, which they're actually pretty close to doing. We could destroy Tamarian Drummer on our or on this turn by going with the Initiate, marking it, and then playing one other uh, or specifically a uh, cultist that has the deal three damage when we have three or more cultists and we play this, which would mean Shelard. The timing of that is kind of unfortunate, but 
we might still go that route. It will trigger the next round of the scenario, so that is something. So, I get... Oh, first do this, though. And it gets rid of that. And it gives us a Temerian Drummer, which may be just one power. But hey, if this thing sticks around, it does give us some additional value. Because it can still boost stuff once we eventually get something next to it. So, that's definitely a nice luxury to have. Okay, and they'll go Amphibious Assaults into perhaps another go-to target for triggering Grace. Maybe a Knight Errant? Or a Squire. Knight Errant's probably incoming on the next turn in between these two. Okay, so, I mean, we could. We could Profit, which would mess with that a bit, and it would uh, trigger the last... Chapter, giving us another Eternal Eclipse Deacon. Or we get a little bit greedy and go Thirsty Dame first to get more points from when we apply all those statuses. Mm, I think I do like the disruption that we get from going this route. I do like that. I think this is good timing for the lock. Put someone to the other side of Temerian Drummer so we get... The boost on it. The boost from it, I should say. Okay, now it's a one... Temerian Drummer is really the card that got dropped down in one power. I'm a little surprised. Okay, but it does lock it, and that is a card that would have given them value, so it's not a bad lock. So, I think we're going at least one more turn here. Possibly two more. I mean, the longer we go, the more cultist synergies we can build up. So that's definitely a nice thing to have. So we'll use this, and we'll turn... Hmm... Maybe the other hunting pack? Into also a cultist? And let's go... Let's play Thirsty Dame now. And that way, if we do start loading up on additional statuses with, say, the Eternal Eclipse Initiate on our next turn, then she benefits from all that. Now, we're definitely going to want to save Philippe, or we'd like to at least, to be one of our go-tos for Masquerade Ball. Okay, and it is a Knight Errant, so yeah, I was hoping that we were going to mess up that combo, and they, they delayed by going to Marion Drummer first. Let's see, this is... did just hit? Yeah, just hit. Grace. Okay. So that does give them solid tempo, but we still had a really solid lead here. So looking okay even after that. And we could once again target the Temerian drummer. So I, th I think we we give that a shot. Once again, the longer we go, the more of the cultist synergies we have stacking up here. And they're they've had enough of it. <laughs> they do not want to see any more of this round. So uh alright, fair enough. We'll win round one. Okay, so we have several cultists in hand, but the big thing now is we're looking for Masquerade Ball, and we do have precisely two cultists and Onira, which we actually didn't even use in the previous round. So uh, I'm questioning whether we might want to push a bit here. We might want to do that. Not even sure what we would Onero into at this point. Probably the hunting packs once they have a, a unit with a status out there, or even Thirsty Dame. It's not a bad choice, in fact. The Molehem Servants... I mean, can still set you up to a certain extent, but I think we dump you. There is a hunting pack. Okay. So, the question is, do we get greedy and push? I'm not necessarily sure. We want to go Masquerade Ball right off the bat, but of course if we do, then they, they have to play in this round, because we won round one. So, I'm thinking we might go with the Initiate. And that gives us a little bit of flexibility. We can try to Put a status on them, and then we can thin with Hunting Pack, which is good tempo at that point. Obviously, if we pass here, Dry Pass, then we're on even cards and have last say in round three, which is really nice. But Northern Realms just generally does not do very well in a short round, so maybe if we can bleed out some stuff and make round three shorter, that might benefit us. That might benefit us. If we could force them into using their leader ability. Okay, Natalis. 
They already had AA. Okay, boiling oil to remove. Gotcha. And tempo-wise, it does work. And it removes an engine. So that was, was a very solid play. And ooh, that was going to be our preferred way to apply a status to one of their... Then again, I guess Natalis is a gold, so it wouldn't have worked anyway. Hmm. I mean, we could, if we wanted to, go ball right now. Because this doesn't do much for us. Hunting pack is not set up. Onero into... What? Thing is the Empire just to get a status on a two-power unit. Obviously, we don't really care about getting rid of you right now. But you know what? We're going for it. We're going for it. Okay, they will heat wave. They will heat wave Masquerade Ball. Unfortunate, but can we still make things work here? We do, tempo-wise, still have more than they have right now. So if we pass here, we force them to play one more card to catch us. And at that point, we're at least uneven cards. So we've bled them out a bit. Obviously, bleeding them out with Masquerade Ball is... Not really a sacrifice we want to make, but if they're going to heat wave it, they're going to heat wave it. There's nothing we could really do to stop them. So, I mean, if we had a status, then hunting pack would make some sense. But it doesn't right now. We have a free, quote unquote, Onero, because we've not yet used the echoed copy. So, like, maybe into Yawn just for some tempo here. Maybe we go that route. Just to apply a little more pressure. Okay, it's Donomir. Tempo-wise, that is probably their best option, but it's still not enough. And to get rid of their defender is nice. I mean, it would have been a half-decent target for something like Vincent. Does mean they've applied a status to themselves. So, hey, we can use Hunting Pack and get the thinning and get eight points of value out of that. And still get more value from this play than they got on their previous play. And if this was their best tempo option then that does bode well for pushing a little bit further here. So you know what? Hunting pack, I kind of like in this situation. Okay, Maiden Shield is a card they definitely wanted to have time to boost up. But they don't do that here. Now with their leader ability, boost by five is enough. They, okay, bold. They opted not to use their leader ability to immediately trigger the grace there, and they would have gotten that leader ability back. A slightly reduced power version of it, but tempo-wise, that probably made the most sense. Actually, with that might have tied them up with us, or been right about there. So, at this point, I mean, we can get one extra point on the hunting pack when we play Master of Ceremonies. It means it's functionally, what, an 8? Which... It's not amazing, it's decent tempo if we are looking at a short round three, which we are looking at a short round three. So I think this might be where we pass, or you know what? No, we're gonna go for it. That's definitely gonna be the last card that we play though, because at this point, we've established that they are hard pressed to find the tempo to keep pace with us, unless they go leader ability here, triangle within a triangle for the boost. Oh, okay, and leader ability. Yeah, but they did get it back, It's the thing. So it, it might have been worth passing just because we knew that that was a good opportunity for them to use leader ability and they opted not to on their previous turn. This time they did. Uh, they didn't really need it as much. So it's a little odd, but hold on a second. Hold on a second. Vincent gets zeal because we have a vampire. So we can immediately go straight into poison. Then, on our next turn, we can immediately use a second round of poison to destroy Donmir. And then at that point, because you have a status, we can target you with Vincent. That's very tempting. We are going to try that. We are going to try that, in fact. Not to mention, Vincent, or rather, Philippe has been turned into a cultist, so we get a little bit more of a point slam out of that. Oh, and yeah, actually, Vincent had our starting cultist buff. Okay, statuses actually help Thirsty Game at least a little bit. But now it's remove you 
And then it's remove you. Because that is just huge value. And extra damage, because we have the three cultists and you were a cultist here. Question is, do we try to go absolutely all in with also going for a leader ability charge here just to get a seven point body on the board? Uh, it might be worth doing that. I think it is. I think it is. Obviously, we're not going to draw into anything here, but they realize there's no way they can catch us, so we will take the 2-0 win. All right, so going up against Skellige here, and they'll go first. Okay, and we drew into Masquerade Ball, which is generally the scenario that we'd prefer to play in round three. But uh, we also got Fisher King, which when combined with our leader ability means we can guarantee that we draw into our other scenario, or Oniro. So uh, we do have enough Aristocrats that if we wanted to go Masquerade Ball, we could still make that work. Let's maybe dump you and you. Oh. Okay, we have some interesting options here. At this point, we actually, with Yawn, don't really need the Fisher King much anymore. So I mean, it does still mean that we're looking to go leader building in round one in all likelihood in order to draw into that scenario, unless we feel like we're using it, uh, Masquerade Ball in round one instead, but I generally think the alternative is preferable. So, why don't we go... Let's see, in terms of gold, uh, Cultus, we have Profit as well, just making sure we have enough to trigger it. So that's one, and then I thought I saw we got the, yeah... Cultist status on Shilar. So yeah, it is still possible. And Yawn. Oh, okay. Um, in that case, maybe we will actually go Fisher King first instead. We have reason to go someone else first. I mean, we could we could lock you. We have some aristocrats to spare, I think. So yeah, we'll go that route. Next turn will be Fisher King. Then we'll use leader ability to draw into the uh really Oniro is probably preferable. Okay. I'm in a warship. Might start dealing some damage to us. Let us go for you. The reason why I'm not doing Yawn first is because he does have the special cultist tag. Technically, could wait a turn before we use leader ability. But yeah, we want to wait to play Yawn until we have three cultists on the board so we get the extra damage on an infused target, which can be a nice way to hit and destroy Something that we infuse with one of the initiates. Really? I'm not sure why you're insisting on... Either of those things, to be honest with you. Um, okay. So... In that case, I think we go... If we just go leader ability and probably play this scenario on this very turn is the way we go about doing this. So there's Morfran. There's the Oniro that we were guaranteed. And we might also prefer a hunting pack to some of the alternatives here. Um, we want to make sure that we still have the aristocrats saved up for a subsequent round with Masquerade Ball. Maybe we dump the Van Wallenheim Servant. And... Hesitant to dump Thirsty Dame. I guess we will. We'll have an Oniro. So, uh, Owen. Okay, gotta be kind of quick here. I'm loitering. There we go. That's what we want. So, get this out early enough that we at least have some time to benefit from it, of course. And we will... They can't even destroy it. Well, Leader Ability plus Terror this ease they could use to destroy Eternal uh, Eclipse Initiate. They really want to go that route. Rather they not do that, because we really would like to get that Order Ability off, but... You know, if they want to sacrifice that much, then fair enough, I suppose. Holger. Okay. Does give them some potential for additional damage. Now, they actually, they're going to deal damage to this Divin Warship even without our assistance. So there's something to be said for marking that. That's the easy target, because then we don't really even need to damage it ourselves. Um, yeah, I guess we probably go that route, to be honest. And then... 
maybe Master Ceremonies just to get another gold cultist out here. So technically, we... Oh, we don't have enough cultists on the board anyway to trigger uh, the three damage here. So yeah, I was going to say that would be guaranteed to take you out, but it's not really needed on this occasion, I don't think, because that's going to damage them anyway. And uh, or they're going to damage themselves anyway. And we didn't have enough cultists to make it happen. Okay, Deranged Corsair on a relatively weak Van Molenheim Hunter is not a bad idea. We'll see where this Cataclysm ends up hitting. We, of course, want to hit things other than the Van Molenheim Hunter. And if it does survive, we... Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see what happens here. Good target for the discard, for sure, from their stratagem. Where does this damage go? Who dodged a bullet. Okay. So, let us, in that case, we can either... Stay in with Hunting Pack, but I think we might just want to go straight into triggering the next chapter of the scenario. And at this point, don't need the three damage. It's overkill. Playing any cultist will destroy you at this point. So I think if we go Profit here, I think that's the plan. Destroy you. Get some more cultists going. And we will turn, I think, Hunting Pack into the cultist because we might end up saving probably will ideally save Vincent for a later round okay your sock invader oh it's just barely enough for them and they might yeah go that route with terror of the seas okay so hunting pack thins out the other hunting pack because they certainly have statuses so I do like that approach. They don't have anything infused. So Yon is, despite being a card that we like to play in round one, not amazing for that reason. I think it's probably still Hunting Pack here. And it might even turn into the last card that we play. It is a cultist. We made it into a cultist, so we get the boost. So we're on even cards right now. So we are... Keeping good pace here. And we're getting close, though, to the point where we'd rather not play these cards. Obviously, we don't want to play Masquerade Ball in round one. But, uh... Yon, we could still play. I mean, he's a cultist, so he's going to give us the uh, boost there. Same with Shelard. We did not turn Vincent into a cultist, so we're definitely going to try to save. These two are the ones that we really rather not use. Okay, it's the Scald, which is not great tempo. Oh, and they still have not gotten the lock from the Prophets. So they're not even getting the discard here. So they have not caught us, and they've played one more card than us. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to pass and force them to either give us the win with one card advantage or go two cards down, which should mean pretty much guaranteed card advantage for the re remainder of the game. So uh, definitely the Cult has paid off here. And that's right around where we wanted to pass, so that works really well in that sense as well. They will continue to play. And the Corsair should, yeah, should do the trick for them, but at what cost? It means there are two cards down here. Okay, and so we're looking for a throwaway in this round, which I mean, Yon would be nice in that it does line up our deck to give us our highest cards drawing into round three, but we have most of the big stuff we're looking for here. Shelard actually gives us a bit of carryover from the uh, reducing the strongest card in their hand down to a 1. So that's tempting. I mean, if we were to play Yon, we'd get, what, Philippe is the thing we'd guarantee, and then maybe more Deacons or Thirsty Dame, which is not bad, but it might not be a game changer. So this is probably our best throwaway, and maybe we leave it at that. I think we do. I think we just stick with this, and we use you. Assuming they don't play. I mean, if they play, that's a, that's a very bold strategy. Okay, they will try pass. They will. And that's to be expected, I think. So, I think we were saying Van Moldeham's Servant is probably our preferred throwaway here. Not to say it's bad. It can help set us up for some of our other statuses. But still, probably not as big of a deal. Okay, and we pretty much drew into our best possible cards here. We said that we didn't really want to play Yon because we missed out on three damage here, and we 
would have guaranteed that we draw into Philippe. Would be the best card in our deck still. We drew into him anyway, even without Yon. So that's awesome. And Shelard, I mean, we can still benefit from uh, reducing their highest card down to a 1. And uh, we now have Legitimate Cultist and Masquerade Ball Aristocrat Synergies here. So I don't even think there is anything we'd rather have. I mean, maybe a second Thirsty Dame, but I think we can definitely settle for this. And I don't even know what... I mean, we can use Onero to get a second Thirsty Dame, I suppose. Or maybe even a Van Morlehem Servant. Okay, how many Aristocrats do we have? How urgent is it that we play them? We have one, two, three, four. So we have plenty. Five, even. So yeah, we can proactively play some if we really want to. Um, yeah. Although, then again, turning cards into Cultists before we play them is also... A very useful thing to do so we might go this first i think and we'll turn i think this thirsty dame into one i mean it does mean she's gonna get pretty tall in that case but then again i think we kind of like that at least to a little bit to a certain extent so she more quickly gets out of removal range because this is skelga so they certainly have damage and then we could potentially even use this if it doesn't get immediately destroyed and it doesn't look like it will to turn whatever it is we're going to get with Oniromancy into a cultist as well. No, we could block that if we really wanted to. Uh, do we have? We do still have Ben Moldehem Hunter in deck if we felt like that was important enough to shut it down. And we could. We definitely could. That's an option. Uh, I mean, it's one point per turn. You know... I think we can and if we're gonna do it we should do it now so let's go for it let us let us do that there you are give you a lock and we get more cultists getting boosted up so that's really nice and probably looking for thirsty game next okay yeah i figured we were probably gonna see their scenario because we did see some of the new Skelga cards, including some pirates. These two cards do look really similar, though, for what it's worth. Basically just, this is that card from a different angle. Uh, leader building on what? The Van Morlehem Hunter? It's a little bit odd. It is a little bit odd, and it does theoretically mean that Thirsty Dame is a little bit safer now. So, the problem is with this guy, we can't really target it with control because the scenario... If it gets destroyed, we'll bring it back by the last chapter, or we'll purify it if it's still there. And so it, no matter what we do, it's going to get uh, brought back in some way, shape, or form if we try to control it immediately. So I think we'll still... I think we'll still Thirsty Dame here. And then next turn... What do we have? We'll do you first, actually. Boost you up, and it means that when we have Thirsty Dame on the board here, we can immediately apply status and get her boosted further. In fact, we don't really, well, we don't yet have a card that we particularly want to target with this, because we can't go after you and you're locked, so that doesn't really work either. We didn't really care about that Van Morlehem Hunter, which is why I was surprised that they focused on that. Okay, Covenant of Steel is not something we can target with you, but we could remove you with Vincent. And we probably will remove you with Vincent. Either that or Philippe, if we give him some time. Yeah, we should get... I think we're going Masquerade Ball here, to be honest. So we can start to play our Aristocrats without having to worry about, is it too soon? So, yeah. So we want to either just immediately get rid of you with Vincent or give ourselves a little bit of time to lock and then start poisoning you with Vincent. Yeah. Here we go. Also begs the question, what are they trying to hide behind Covenant of Steel? Might it be Bjorn? In which case... Gilard becomes very interesting. I'm feeling like that's what they're doing. They're going to Bjorn this? Yeah. Okay. So at 8 power. Okay, that does trigger the last round of their scenario. So suddenly we can target you. Gonna double down on the damage on you, which is not ideal for them. So let's see. I think now that we have 
played Masquerade Ball. We can get aggressive with Vincent. This is our quickest way to remove the defender. If we're more patient, Philippe, we uh, no longer have a vampire. So actually, he's even slower now than he was before. Yeah. Yeah, that might mean that we're looking to Vincent here. And then at this point, they've used the last round of their scenario so we can actually control you and at 10 power. It's not bad for you to be uh, our poison target. So I think it's probably this. Remove you. And then poison you. And we still don't really have something to go after with you because the lock does not combine with this. Okay, Freya's blessing into what? I mean, it is going to be a bronze, which means we can actually use this, which is nice. Uh, okay, Corsair makes sense. Does make sense. They're probably going range row for the deacon. Or are they? They are not. Ooh. Okay, I think that might have been a bit of a misplay. This was at least the easiest card for them to remove in the short term, but it's about to get much bigger. So now we might just go Thirsty Dame to set up. I mean, either it's... Hmm, how much time do we want for Philippe? Because if we play him now, we can lock you and then we can eventually poison you with, through Philippe. We'll get the second round of Masquerade Ball when we play him. I mean, yeah, I guess either way we're... No matter what, we're getting Masquerade Ball final round here. So I think we still go Thirsty Dame then. Get the more points on it. Do that to you. And that to you. And with two statuses on you already, that means we should be able to remove you through Philippe. I think it's going to be that. And then on our next turn... And then, depends on how clever we want to get with the timing of this seagull. They needed the Bloodthirst, actually, to do exactly that. Okay, and they had a card they wanted to remove. All right, so here's the thing. We know that they have Bjorn in hand. And if we play Sheetlard Fitzosterlin, it's almost for certain that that is their tallest card, because he's an eight, and he is very, very affected by... Uh, being being reduced down to one power because his whole ability is based on dealing damage to your opponent. So I think this is probably the time for Shelard. It's a little bit earlier than I'd hoped or than I'd planned to do it. And it does perhaps mean that Philippe's going to be a little bit awkward, might not really be able to get much value out of him otherwise, or other than just giving a little bit more statuses to support Thirsty Dame. But I think this cripples their entire deck, their entire plan here. So that's what... Shelard is there for. It also gives us the damage to destroy the deranged Corsair because Shelard had the three damage when we play him whenever we have more than three cultists, and we did. So that's a big tempo swing for us, and we now know that I'm pretty sure, unless they had something bigger than Bjorn in hand, which is unlikely, but if they did, then that's even more weakened than Bjorn would have been. So I think they are now in a really rough spot. It is not Bjorn. Oh. Wow. What is it then? Also, for what it's worth, they get the seagulls back out, but those count as statuses, so Thirsty Dame does still get boosted from them. So it's a Thirsty Dame is a bit of a counter to the seagull, if you want to call it that. Um, we should play Philippe. He's not a cultist, unlike Jan, so we're not going to get quite as much value. But let's see, we've doesn't really work on you because it's going to be yeah no matter what it's, it's pretty useless the statuses we're getting from outside is just giving a slightly larger boost to thirsty dame so it is technically still i think the the right play to do this earlier on this turn here rather than with uh yawn but like don't think that stops bjorn Although they... Oh. Oh. They can't use it? Oh, they don't have enough Bloodthirst anyway. Okay. And we know this should have one power because we crippled it using Shelar Fitzoslin, and that means they do not have a finisher. So we'll take the win. They'll forfeit.
All right, so going up against monsters here. And they'll go first. Okay, so we have both scenarios in hand here. We do not have any gold units at all. So definitely don't have the means to set up the Eternal Eclipse unless we draw into something. We could get a little bit more with Onero. What started off with the, the Cultist tag, Shilar did, and Vincent did. Okay, so we're looking for one of those or just a straight up Cultist draw. So I think we probably dump you. Okay, Philippe is good, but, but I think we're still... Looking to swap out. Okay, there is a cultist. Okay, so we actually do have enough now. Assuming we use Onero to get one of the others. Melee Row Cave Troll. First turn. If it weren't for Overwhelming Hunger, I would say it might be Kelly. But maybe they just are really... A Vi? Probably Vi, I guess? To set up their consumption? Okay, um, all right, in that case, let's go, I mean, normally I would say the Eternal Eclipse would be our go-to for round one, and that gives us more long-term value, and then Masquerade Ball is our round three, but Masquerade Ball can help us break through that cave troll a little more easily, and along with the cards that we'd like to play with uh, Masquerade Ball. But, I think... We'll still start with this. Start with this. We are planning to go... We're gonna, we're gonna see through. We're gonna go Eternal Eclipse. Okay, Thaw. Okay, that... It's a little odd. Oh, well, they don't want us to mark it. Fair. Okay. Uh, all the more reason why breaking something out like Vincent's is really, really tempting right about now. But, I'd like to save him for ball setup, but we might not be able to afford that now. Because I think we are going the Eclipse here. No time yet, or no target yet, for this, but I think... Now that we have you out, we can consider going with Onero into Vincent to get rid of this boosted up defender on our next turn. Right, the quantity of boosts from special cards makes it feel like Kelly. But uh, now it is, I'm feeling a little bit better about removing this very highly invested cave troll now. Even if we would normally like to save Vincent, I mean that's that's still pretty decent value at this point. So, where are you, Vincent? The downside... The downside is that we would have, ideally, been able to mark the person that we destroyed with Vincent. It is Kelly. Okay. We'll lose Vincent. And we can lock Kelly. I mean, they... Probably have the means to unlock her, but we do have several ways to lock her. I mean, these are our aristocrats here, bear in mind, so we want to make sure we still have enough of those to trigger Masquerade Ball in the next round, but we can proceed. Shelard is the card that's going to trigger our last round of the scenario. Hmm. Okay, you also did not get a cultist tag. I think we're still locking you, though. I think we're still locking you, though. So, yeah. There's the lock removal, as we might have expected to see. And we can lock you with Philippe. Or, actually, it would be doomed on our first turn. Then we'd lose one of these. Hmm. I think we still go for it. We would have enough time by our next... Oh, except we don't have... Don't have a vampire, so we don't get zeal. Does also 
complicate matters. You could actually deliberately play Mage Infiltrator on their side, get a little bit of damage, and make it so that uh, Kelly is not quite as effective. Oh, well played. Well played. It does prevent Kelly from destroying anything on this turn. It does also mean Mage Infiltrator I mean, <laughs> would destroy Geralt Professional and get it back on our side, which means we have something else for Kelly to destroy other than these initiates. Hmm. Do we like that, though? Or do we actually like Mage Infiltrator here to deliberately brick Kelly and force them into destroying their own unit and giving us a little bit more ability to play what we want? E. Not a huge fan of that. Um, we could just... Oof. Yeah. Yeah. We will. And now Kelly would destroy Mage Infiltrator on their next turn. If they don't do anything to stop that. I mean, it's still very likely to happen. So it does put them in a, a tough spot here. Okay, they will play Fortune Teller, and with it, give Veil to Kelly. We weren't really going to be able to do much from that. So now it does mean that we're going to flood our side with more units. Now we're basically pretty committed to, rather than putting more units on their side of the board, putting more units on our side of the board. So uh, I think it's Shelard weakening their strongest card they have in their hand. Then again, they might not have any units right now. I would not rule that out. But we do this, and we do Shelard. And that means that Shelard will damage you and actually get rid of you, which means we should have enough cards here. We actually don't have anything to add the Cultist Tag to. But we have enough units on the board now that Kelly right now would destroy one of our ones. It's not a huge deal. We have another one power unit, so that's also not a huge deal. We have so many more units than them on the border. Hey, hit Detloff. That's not bad. They will use their leader ability, which pacing-wise is not enough unless they use both charges. Okay. It does also force them to get more units onto the board. So that is kind of a nice thing to see, and they have some bronzes now. So... Initiate, I mean, can. Can now go after them to a certain extent. Um... It's probably another initiate here. And... Yeah. Make some more cultists. I suppose. This is probably going to be our... Probably going to be our last play. Let's go for a hunting pack since we might thin that out at some point. Play you. Who's our, uh, our cultists? It is just enough that... How, actually, what's the unit count here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 versus 6. So we are going to lose this Mage Infiltrator. We might consider still playing this Eternal Eclipse Deacon. It's a possibility. So it would give us a, enough time to mark somebody here and, and play you. And you, obviously you're a cultist. Okay, Royal Decree into what? Vivian. Ooh. All right, well, it's a big point slam. It does mean that they've now played more units, and that is probably one of their go-tos that they just had to use in round one. So maybe what we do here is at this point, we've bled out some big stuff. I mean, I very much imagine their plan is to, uh, which is Sabbath, to get Kelly back in the next round. We do this. And we do leader ability. And just basically ignore the cards that we draw into. That might be enough here, though, to, to catch them. Or at least put some pressure on them. I mean, we know we don't want to play this last card, but... What if we take a bit of a gamble here? Go for the big boost and damage them. And we technically don't even need to use this. Now, they're going to destroy our Mage Infiltrator with Kelly. 
at the end of their turn, even if they don't do anything, but that's still enough points for us. So, look at that. Look at that. Win round one against Kelly, and we still have our Masquerade Ball. Okay, so now we did play several of our Aristocrats, though, so we need to consider that. We can get one for sure with Oniro. We have two Thirsty Dames, and is that it? Uh, Yan as well. So can we draw into one of them here? That'd be nice. That would be nice. And the thinning is also nice. I think we do dump you. It is... Oh. So it is enough to go Masquerade Ball here. Do we push for 2-0 like that? If we do, we probably need to play it turn 1. Otherwise, we're bricking Hunting Pack. Because it obviously our opponent doesn't have any units with status. If we let them, if we dry pass here and let them get a throwaway card in round two, then Kelly is actually not bad, even when they're some cards down, and maybe they realize that, well, they're in a tough spot here, so they actually forfeit. No Masquerade Ball needed. So there's a look at a Nilfgaard double scenario deck. If you liked the video, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button, and leave a comment down below to let me know which other cards, archetypes, and factions you'd like us to experiment with next. Also, keep an eye out for more Rogue Mage, which is the new standalone single-player Gwent game that just got released. We'll be streaming it this Friday on Twitch. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time.